good morning good afternoon or good evening depending on wherever in the world you may be on behalf of the department of law it is my utmost pleasure to invite you to do this webinar we are privileged to have professor adil hawk to talk on use cousins before i formally invite professor hawk to deliver his talk let me take a couple of minutes to introduce his to this talk we as a student of public international law, when we talk about sources of law or when we talk about treaty law, we refer to exclusions in a way that uh, they have to be accepted in a technical way that they are non-derogable, they are norms that must be obeyed. But as Professor Hawk, I had the pleasure of reading his uh, draft paper, which is a very well-crafted one, as he has sh shown that it is not just about the technicalities, it is not just about non-derogability. These use cousins now are non-derogable because they embody certain values. As many of you might know, that states do not put emphasis on the genocide as a use cousins now because they think that there will be a treaty which would say that, okay, we are going to commit genocide or a treaty would somehow validate genocide. As Professor Hawk has very rightly and cosently identified that there are some very, very fundamental values behind these use cousins. And perhaps we need to focus more on those values rather than on the technicalities. Although much of Professor uh, Hawk's draft paper may seem to be theoretical and there's nothing wrong with the theoretical paper, he actually has done much more. He has very nicely linked it to practicalities and how those underlying theoretical conceptions can actually have a significant practical impact that would also be evident from the paper. I would not want to waste more of your time in my introduction. Uh, I would look forward to what Professor Hawk says and of course, to your questions, dear audience. Thank you all for your time. Professor Hawk, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. Thank you to uh, <clears throat> the organizers uh, for putting this together. And thanks to all of you for taking time uh, to listen. I know for most of you, it's, uh, it's evening. So I appreciate you uh, making time for this discussion. Um, so as my title suggests, I'm going to talk today about the relationship between peremptory norms of general international law, use Kogans, and the fundamental values of the international community. My basic claim will be that peremptory norms, their characteristics, their consequences, and their content are best explained by their moral function. In contrast, the formal characteristic of non-derogability is a consequence of this moral function rather than a basic or fundamental feature. Now, why does this matter? And why does this matter now? So as you may know, the International Law Commission recently adopted on second reading, a set of draft conclusions and commentaries on peremptory norms. It's quite likely that the ILC's work will be widely viewed as a definitive restatement of the law in this area, but the conclusions are at best ambiguous about what holds this area of law together, why peremptory norms have these characteristics and consequences, these legal properties, as opposed to others, and why they have this content as opposed to some other. And on balance, the commentaries tend to favor the view that non-derogability lies at the center of it all, explaining characteristics like hierarchical superiority and universal applicability, as well as consequences like the invalidity of conflicting rules. And that is the view that I will reject. Since most of my remarks today will be critical, I should say at the outset that the ILC's work on this topic is overall uh, an important and positive contribution to international law. States have already made good use of it in their responses to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, as well as Israel's ongoing occupation of Palestine. Uh, more on that later. And while I wish fundamental values played a more pervasive role in the conclusions and commentaries, they might have been removed altogether. Uh, but for the integrity and fortitude of the special rapporteur, uh, Dire Talari, to whom we all owe a debt of gratitude. 
Nevertheless, uh, as a scholar, I'm concerned that the ILC's account will distort our understanding of peremptory norms and impede the clarification, application, and development of this area of law. If we don't understand what peremptory norms are or why they have the legal properties that they have, then we can't reason about them logically or teleologically, deductively or systemically. Their various legal attributes will seem randomly assembled like a bundle of sticks, a heap of rules rather than an integrated structure. And this would be especially damaging for international law in which the social facts that ultimately determine the existence and content of legal rules, uh, the practices and attitudes of states are seldom fully known to us. So here more than anywhere else, legal reasoning must presuppose a level of logical consistency and normative coherence, lest this dynamic legal system grind to a halt. I should also say at the outset that the moral function of peremptory norms is fully consistent with mainstream legal positivism. My claim is not that the existence or content of any specific peremptory norm depends on moral facts rather than on social facts alone. My claim is simply that human beings created the legal category of peremptory norms for a reason, to reflect and protect their fundamental values through law, whatever those values happen to be. So if we think of peremptory norms as human artifacts, like chairs or songs, we need to know why human beings created them, what function or purpose they serve, and how their various features help them serve that function. By rationally reconstructing this area of law, we understand why committed participants in legal practice made the law as it is and developed the law as they do. In this way, the moral function of peremptory norms explains their legal properties by rationally justifying them. So the account I'm offering today should supplement and illuminate historical and doctrinal accounts of the emergence and evolution of the law in this area. So let's start with the ILC's draft conclusions two and three, which are at the heart of my talk today. So conclusion two is entitled Nature of Peremptory Norms and provides, quote, peremptory norms of general international law, use Kogan's, reflect and protect fundamental values of the international community. They're universally applicable and hierarchically superior to other rules of international law. Now, on its face, conclusion two seems to say that the most fundamental fact about peremptory norms, their very nature, is that they reflect and protect fundamental values. The commentaries tell us that conclusion two describes the, quote, essential characteristics of peremptory norms. And in philosophy, the essential characteristics of a thing make it the kind of thing that it is, as opposed to something else, and explain or ground its other necessary properties, the properties it always has and cannot lack. So the nature or essential characteristics of peremptory norms should explain their other legal characteristics and consequences, as well as their content. Similarly, the commentaries tell us that the fundamental value underlying a peremptory norm provides a rationale for its peremptory status. And that is roughly the view that I'll defend today. But now look at conclusion three entitled Definition of a Peremptory Norm, which provides a peremptory norm of general international law, use Kogan's, is a norm accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a whole as a norm from which no derogation is permitted and which can be modified only by a subsequent norm of general international law having the same character. Now, you might wonder, what is the difference between a definition of a peremptory norm and a description of its nature in other words, what kind of definition does conclusion three offer? Now, as most of you know, or have guessed, uh, conclusion three is drawn from Article 53 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. But Article 53 provides only a stipulative definition of peremptory norms, offered only, quote, for the purposes of the present convention. In other words, the VCLT stipulates this definition for ease of reference, not as a precise, exhaustive, or fundamental account of peremptory norms. Conclusion three also doesn't look like a nominal definition meant to capture the meaning or common usage of the term peremptory norm, or even the term use cogens. Instead, on its face, conclusion three offers what philosophers call a real definition, 
which is a statement or explanation of the nature or essence of the thing to which the term refers. Indeed, the draft commentaries refer to the, quote, added quality of having a peremptory character that is being accepted and recognized as non-derogable, apparently equating peremptoriness and non-derogability. So conclusions two and three seem to offer competing accounts of the nature or essence of peremptory norms. And in fact, these two conclusions began their lives as a single conclusion entitled General Nature of Euskogen's Norms in the Special Rapporteur's first report and were only later split into two. So which account is right? Which is more illuminating? Which best helps us understand what peremptory norms are at the most fundamental level and why they have their other legal properties as well as their substantive content? As many of you know, the question of whether peremptory norms should be understood in terms of their substantive content or their legal form goes back at least to the 1950s, if not earlier. And in large part, I'm carrying forward the stance of people like George Abisab. But the ILC's draft conclusions offer an opportunity to take stock of this area of law as it stands today. So let's start at the end. If you look at the ILC's non-exhaustive list of peremptory norms annexed to the conclusions, the most obvious thing they have in common is their moral importance. The prohibitions of genocide, crimes against humanity, apartheid, slavery, and torture, as well as the basic rules of international humanitarian law, reflect and protect the fundamental value of individual human beings. The prohibition of aggression and the right of self-determination reflect and protect the fundamental value of political communities. As the ILC itself said in its commentaries on state responsibility, peremptory norms are, for the most part, substantive rules of conduct that prohibit what has come to be seen as intolerable because of the threat it presents to the survival of states and their peoples and the most basic human values. In contrast, it's a frequent joke among international lawyers that the non-derogability of these norms is almost completely beside the point. As Rizwan mentioned, it's hard to even imagine a treaty purporting to displace one of these norms. No state accepts the prohibition of genocide as peremptory because they're worried that other states will agree by treaty to allow one another to commit genocide against their respective populations. Instead, states accept the prohibition as peremptory to affirm its moral importance and to trigger other legal consequences to which we now turn. So conclusion 19 provides a quote, states shall cooperate to bring to an end through lawful means any serious breach of a peremptory norm and quote, no state shall recognize as lawful a situation created by a serious breach of a peremptory norm, nor render aid or assistance in maintaining that situation. Again, the most obvious explanation for these obligations is that they reflect and protect the same fundamental values that underlie the peremptory norm itself. Put the other way around, the peremptory norm obligates states and others to respect these values, not to violate them. But if that primary obligation is breached, then it falls to other states to protect these values from further violation and to respect these values themselves. In contrast, the fact that a norm is non-derogable has no obvious implications for how other states should respond to its breach. It's perfectly logical to say that a norm cannot be set aside by treaty or otherwise, and that states are free to respond to this breach the same way they would respond to any other breach of international law, including by not responding at all. Conclusion 18 provides that, quote, no circumstance precluding wrongfulness under the rules on state responsibility may be invoked with regard to any breach of a peremptory norm. Again, it's easy to see why the fundamental value underlying a norm would render its breach unjustifiable and inexcusable in any circumstances. This is simply a matter of the greater value underlying the norm invariably outweighing the lesser value at stake in various circumstances. In contrast, it's quite hard to see how the fact that states may not derogate from a norm by free choice, setting it aside indefinitely, at least among treaty parties, implies that states may not breach that norm in exceptional circumstances not of their own making, force majeure, distress, necessity, and so forth. Here, I think the ILC took a wrong turn many years ago 
uh, in its commentaries to its draft articles on state responsibility, the ILC wrote that, quote, circumstances precluding wrongfulness do not authorize or excuse any derogation from a peremptory norm. In a later passage, the ILC wrote, evidently a peremptory norm not subject to derogation as between states, even by treaty, cannot be derogated from by a unilateral action in the form of countermeasures. So essentially these passages conflate derogation with deviation, that is with breach, contravention, or non-conformity. But this is a mistake. Derogation is a legal act, the exercise of a legal power. Breach is a material act which violates a legal obligation. At the time of the VCLT, it was understood that derogation meant creating a legal rule, typically by treaty, which would displace customary international law by operation of the Lex Specialis principle. In contrast, breaching a legal obligation in response to a circumstance precluding wrongfulness neither makes nor changes the law. It simply breaks the law, albeit for a reason that the law accepts or tolerates. So non-derogability cannot explain why peremptory norms are indefeasible or intransgressible. For that, you need to appeal to the importance of their content. Conclusion 17 uh, provides that peremptory norms, quote, give rise to obligations owed to the international community as a whole, obligations erga omnes, in relation to which all states have a legal interest. Now, if peremptory norms reflect and protect fundamental values, then it makes sense that every state has a legal interest in compliance with the corresponding obligations, since every breach will injure or disrespect its fundamental values. In contrast, it doesn't make obvious sense that one state's breach of a norm from which it was legally powerless to derogate necessarily implicates the legal interests of any state not directly injured. One could say that all states have a legal interest in the integrity of international law, but that would imply that all states have a legal interest in compliance with all of international law, which seems to go too far. Put another way, common interest in fundamental values explains non-derogability, but not the other way around. Conclusions 10 through 16 provides that treaties, customs, unilateral acts, and decisions of international organizations that conflict with peremptory norms are void or invalid, they are without legal force, and they give rise to no legal rules or legal obligations. Needless to say, these legal consequences seldom arise in practice. Uh, their significance is structural and systemic. It is in virtue of these consequences that peremptory norms provide general criteria of legal invalidity for international law as a whole across all the sources of international law, thereby confirming that international law is a system and not merely an unrelated set of rules. Now, you might think surely here, non-derogability will do some explanatory work. After all, the VCLT both defined peremptory norms in terms of their non-derogability and identified invalidity as the legal consequence of conflict between a treaty and a peremptory norm. So surely non-derogability should explain invalidity. But in fact, it doesn't. In fact, the ILC itself once noted that non-derogability neither entails nor explains invalidity. In its commentaries to its draft articles on the law of treaties that became the VCLT with modifications, the ILC pointed out that any treaty may prohibit derogation from its provisions, but that a subsequent treaty purporting to derogate from the first would not be invalid. Instead, the conclusion of the subsequent treaty would amount to a breach of the first, as would any action that violates the terms of the first treaty. So invalidity is not a logical or legal consequence of non-derogability as such. Instead, as the ILC wrote, it is not the form of a general rule of international law, but the particular nature of the subject matter with which it deals that may give it the character of Euskogans. In other words, it is the moral content of a peremptory norm that explains why attempts to derogate from it are not only prohibited, but also invalid and without legal effect. To say that a norm is invalid 
is to say that it is not a member of the legal order in question. There are two reasons to deny a norm membership in a legal order. The first is that the norm does not arise in the right way from the sources of law recognized in the legal order. The second is that the norm's content does not conform to the legal order's substantive requirements for membership. And these substantive requirements typically reflect the fundamental values of the legal order. These values explain why the non-conforming norm is anathema and must be cast out. The mere promulgation of the norm is an offense against the legal order for which nullity is the sanction. Finally, let's turn to conclusion four, which provides a quote to identify a peremptory norm. It is necessary to establish that the norm in question is accepted and recognized as non-derogable. Similarly, conclusion six provides that to identify a norm as a peremptory norm, there must be evidence that, the, that such a norm is accepted and recognized as non-derogable. These conclusions naturally are naturally read to favor the view that non-derogability is the fundamental or central feature of a peremptory norm. Why else would the ILC require evidence that states accept a norm's non-derogability as opposed to any other feature of peremptory status? But think about this for a moment. As we've already seen, when states invoke the peremptory status of a norm, derogation and modification are typically the furthest things from their minds. They're typically much uh, more concerned with cooperating to end a breach or denying recognition and assistance to a resulting situation or invoking the responsibility of the breaching state or simply with condemning the indefeasible wrongfulness of the breach. So what will be the practical effect of conclusions four and six? They might make it harder to identify peremptory norms, since non-derogability typically isn't at issue in international disputes. Or they might lead to states adopting a kind of script where they mention the non-derogability of a norm, even when it's irrelevant to the circumstances at hand. Or states might circumvent these conclusions, hack them, uh, by deeming that any time a state affirms the peremptory status of a norm, or invoke some other legal property that only peremptory norms have. This is indirect evidence that the state regards the norm as non-derogable, which in turn is direct evidence of peremptory status. All of this seems a bit silly, uh, I think. Once we understand the legal properties of peremptory norms as unified by their moral function, states can indicate their acceptance and recognition of a norm's peremptory status by invoking any of those legal properties, or indeed simply by declaring the norm peremptory. There is no reason to privilege non-derogability in the identification process. I want to dwell on identification just a bit more. Suppose you agree that states accept and recognize norms as peremptory in order to reflect and protect their fundamental values. You might still hesitate to identify a norm as peremptory simply based on what states say about its moral importance. After all, most rules of international law implicate some value or other to a greater or lesser extent. So just because a state says that a norm protects a fundamental value, that might not be reliable evidence that it accepts the norm as peremptory. For that reason, we may want to say that the essence of peremptory norms lies in their moral function but we should identify them by asking whether states accept that they have legal properties that all or only peremptory norms possess. So recognition that a norm is general and non-derogable would be indicative, perhaps sufficient, but not necessary as the ILC claims. Okay, uh, let's turn from uh, content to characteristics. I hope it's clear that the fact that a peremptory norm reflects and protects fundamental values explains its universal applicability to all subjects of international law. No one can remain exempt or exempt themselves from such norms without distorting or endangering the values the norms are supposed to reflect and protect. Now, the commentaries say that universal applicability flows from non-derogability. So the idea seems to be that a norm of general international law applies with equal force to all states. And non-derogability ensures that states cannot escape this equal force by derogating from the general rule. 
The problem with this view is that a rule of general international law does not necessarily apply with equal force to all states. That may seem puzzling, so let me explain. That's because a customary rule to which some states persistently object is not opposable to those persistent objectors. But the conclusions and commentaries tell us that such a customary rule can still be elevated to peremptory status, at which point the peremptory objector rule falls away. And the norm for the first time becomes binding on and opposable to all states. So it follows from this that a customary rule to which some states persistently object must be sufficiently general to provide the basis for a peremptory norm, even though it does not apply with equal force to all states. So generality and non-derogability cannot establish universal applicability. If anything, the opposite is the case. Peremptory norms must be non-derogable in order to preserve their universal applicability. It should also be clear that the fact that a peremptory norm reflects and protects fundamental values explains its hierarchical superiority to other rules of international law. Indeed, the ILC study group on the fragmentation of international law concluded that a peremptory norm is, quote, superior to other rules on account of the importance of its content, as well as the universal acceptance of its superiority. It is for this reason that legal obligations arising from peremptory norms prevail over legal obligations arising from other legal rooms, rules when they conflict in a particular case. In contrast, non-derogability does not explain superiority. It's perfectly logical to say that a norm cannot be set aside by a special rule like a bilateral treaty, but if its application conflicts with another general rule, say of customary international law, then perhaps the later in time rule prevails over the earlier rule. Put another way, the inapplicability of lex specialis does not entail the applicability of lex superior, which must be established separately. One last word on superiority. The commentaries say that non-derogability explains superiority, which in turn explains invalidity. On this account, when a peremptory norm conflicts with a treaty rule or a customary rule, the superiority of the peremptory norm explains the invalidity of the conflicting rule. But that must be a mistake. As the ILC's working group on fragmentation explained years ago, a superior rule prevails over an inferior rule, but does not necessarily invalidate it. Think of Article 103 of the UN Charter rule established by uh, the UN prevails over conflicting obligations without invalidating them. Indeed, hierarchical superiority presupposes that both legal rules exist, that both are valid, that both apply to a given situation, that they impose conflicting obligations or rights, and that the obligations or rights arising from the superior rule prevail. Put another way, superiority is relevant when two rules conflict in their application to a particular case. Invalidity occurs when a peremptory norm and an ordinary rule conflict on their face. For example, when the peremptory norm prohibits the general type of act that the ordinary rule permits. So the superiority of peremptory norms as such can't explain the legal invalidity of conflicting rules. The best explanation for invalidity is that the values protected by peremptory norms are so fundamental that it is not enough to tolerate a, conflict, a conflicting rules membership in the legal order while insisting that it should never be followed because the peremptory norm will prevail in every case of conflict. Instead, the conflicting norm must be removed from the legal order entirely to affirm and vindicate the fundamental value at stake. Last but not least, I hope it's clear that the fact that a peremptory norm reflects and protects fundamental values explains its non-derogability, uh, but not vice versa. If states attempt to set aside a peremptory norm, say by treaty, there's no guarantee that the alternative rule they attempt to put in its place, at least as between themselves, will reflect and protect the same fundamental values to the same extent. In contrast, the non-derogability of a peremptory norm does not explain its moral function. 
As the ILC itself explained in commentaries on the law of treaties, states could prohibit derogation from any rule for any reason or no reason at all. But the best explanation for their doing so would be to safeguard the fundamental values that the norm reflects and protects. As the ILC itself explained in its commentaries on state responsibility, peremptory norms are, quote, substantive norms of a fundamental character such that no derogation from them is permitted by treaty. Right? So fundamental values explain non-derogability. All right, uh, so that is my argument that the moral function of peremptory norms explains their legal content, characteristics, and consequences, and that non-derogability is simply one legal property among others. Now, some of you may be wondering if this rather abstract discussion has any practical implications, so let me suggest one. So on April 1st of this year, uh, the UN Human Rights Council adopted uh, Resolution 4928 on the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. The resolution affirms that the right of self-determination is a use Kogan's norm and a right erga omnes. The resolution goes on to, quote, call upon all states to ensure their obligations of non-recognition, non-aid or assistance, with regard to the serious breaches of peremptory norms of international law by Israel, in particular of the prohibition of the acquisition of territory by force in order to ensure the exercise of the right of self-determination and also calls upon them to cooperate further to bring through law means an end to these serious breaches and a reversal of Israel's illegal policies and practices. Now, 41 states voted in favor of the resolution three against with three abstentions. Uh, notice the resolution does not mention non-derogability, which indeed it seems irrelevant in these circumstances. Uh, it simply declares the norm peremptory and invokes its necessary consequences. Now the United States and the United Kingdom voted against this resolution. And there's an obvious political explanation for that specific vote, but there is more to the story. The US and the UK do not accept the peremptory status of self-determination. They have denied that serious breaches of peremptory norms trigger legal obligations of non-assistance, non-recognition, and cooperation. And there are political explanations for that as well. But the US and the UK have also repeatedly asked the ILC to delete conclusion two, referring to fundamental values. And I've often wondered why. How is that connected? Are these positions related to one another? I think they are. Now, the US and UK say they're simply concerned that direct reference to fundamental values would confuse the identification of peremptory norms. But I don't really believe that. I think their real concern is that if the moral function of peremptory norms is acknowledged, as both justifying and explaining their content and consequences, then they will have to defend their legal positions on moral terms. And I think they know that attempt would fail. So let me frame this point a different way. The resolution itself goes a long way toward establishing that self-determination is accepted and recognized as peremptory by what the ILC calls, quote, a very large and representative majority of states. 41 states is a lot, and the sample is fairly representative. So it's reasonable to accept that the vote reflects in microcosm, the views of the international community of states as a whole. But it might not. Until every state in the world puts its cards on the table, we can't know for sure. Now, this is a familiar problem in international law, of course. Uh, the social facts that ultimately determine the content of the law are often partly hidden from us. But we don't let this fact grind the system to a halt. Instead, we engage in legal reasoning, taking seriously the inner logic of the law, accepting its claims, unearthing its presuppositions, identifying its purpose or function, and working out its implications. Now, legal reasoning does not establish that its conclusion is true as a matter of law. After all, the law may be illogical, unreasonable, or normatively incoherent. But the outcome of legal reasoning can stand in for the law 
when its actual content is otherwise unclear. And if lawmakers, states, accept that outcome, then it will become law if it wasn't already. I think the US and the UK understand this at some level, and presumably not in the terms that I've just used. By insisting that peremptory norms are merely non-derogable, they stop legal reasoning in its tracks before it leads where they don't want to go. Legal reasoning can take us from the fundamental value of self-determination to its peremptory status, and from there to obligations of non-assistance, non-recognition, and cooperation. But legal reasoning can't take us anywhere from non-derogability, or at least not very far. And I think they know that, again, at some level. I think this partly explains why, historically, the moral function of peremptory norms has been championed by less powerful states and resisted by more powerful states. Placing fundamental values at the heart or the top or the foundation of international law may have implications that powerful states can't anticipate and may dislike. And that I think lies behind the stance of the US and the UK, as well as the ambivalence and ambiguity of the ILC toward the role of fundamental values in the law of peremptory norms. It is at its core, a fear of too much justice. That's my talk. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Hawk, for your excellent presentation. We have quite a few questions. The first question that I'd like to put to you is from one of our esteemed colleagues, Professor Norman Suajo, a professor of philosophy here at North South University. Norma asks, uh, Contrition 2 includes the concept of fundamental values of the international community, but isn't this concept itself problematic as a matter of both morality and law? If philosopher Alistair McIntyre is correct that one needs to ask whose justice, who is rationality, then a concept of fundamental values has to be clarified accordingly. Yeah, so I think that's right. I think the promise of peremptory norms is to establish a set of universal values that all states accept or at least cannot publicly disavow. I think it was David Caron who said that uh, peremptory norms are uh, the rules that no state uh, can, can uh, publicly disown or publicly uh, oppose because of the values at stake. And that's why peremptory norms are you know, relatively um, uh, few in number, largely prohibitive. Um, and largely focused on um, uh, wrongs against individual human beings with a few uh, related to states and, and collectives. But the promise is that they establish a kind of minimum uh, moral commitment that um, all states across uh, the system share. Uh, and it's notable again, that um, the states most um, uh, supportive of resting the law of peremptory norms on fundamental values historically have been uh, states of the global south, not uniformly, um, but overall. And the states resisting that move have been uh, Western states um, uh, uh, of, uh, of a different, um, with the, well, yes, with a, with a uh, different perspective on, on some of these, uh, on where the law should go. But there's consensus on the values and indeed consensus on the norms. There's a question again about how to understand them, what explains them, and what drives their creation and evolution. So that's really where the, the debate tends to, tends to focus. Thank you for that answer. The next question that we have is from Emmanuel Abe Gunrin. I hope I have pronounced the name correctly. I apologize if I haven't. It makes a comment. Uh, I'm actually putting his second comment first and then I'm putting his question. When it comes to use cousins, the ICJ jurisprudence has made it abundantly clear that it is the human rights law that is unquestionably protected, non viable The second question is, I take your point. I mean, he says that he takes your point, but philosophy is not fixed in its assumption or conclusion. It is forever changing based on new knowledge. So I'm afraid I do not get your analogical argument on peremptory norms. 
Use cousins is just the Latin expression for peremptory norms. Did I miss a point? I see the use cousins are peremptory as the sanctity of respect for universal human rights. Uh, and he says that he would like to read your full text to follow better. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so I don't, um, I don't, I don't think we disagree. I think the the question is about um, what holds this body of law together. So um, if we and and uh, yeah, so the, the the we we have this set of legal characteristics and consequences that the conclusions lay out, and then the question is what explains them what holds them together, how do they relate to one another, and do they have a kind of common core rationale or purpose? And this is provided by their role in reflecting and protecting fundamental values. And it seems like uh, the questioner uh, agrees with that. Now, you could say that non-derogability, um, that all, all the ILC is claiming about non-derogability is just that that's what the term uh, use Kogan's uh, means or has been related to historically. Um, so there are a couple of issues with that. So one is that if that is the claim, then you'd have the odd result that the fact that a norm is use Kogan's, meaning non-derogable, would actually be one of the least interesting and important things about it. Right? And that, that would be, I think, a, a, a reason not to privilege non-derogability in our understanding of this area of law. We probably want to focus on other things, right? They're overriding normative weight, right? um, something else. So my own view is that we should think of peremptory norms as a, a legal category with a whole set of characteristics and consequences, non-derogability is one of them. And what it allows states to do is to take norms that they think reflect and protect their fundamental values and give them a pre-established status that was created uh, just for that purpose, just for norms that have the, that serve that moral function. Um, so that's how I kind of see it. And non-derogability is just one small part of that larger picture. I hope I understood the question. Thank you for that answer. The next question is on the crystallization of USCOS's norm that how do you think uh, use causes norm really crystallizes? And secondly, do you see any obvious known exclusion in the non-exhaustive list of peremptory norms that ILC has recently uh, included in its draft? Any exclusions from the, from the list? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I think, so in terms of crystallization, um, yeah, I, I think that, international law in general um, uh, operates through a, a, a kind of cycle of conjecture and refutation, right? claim and counterclaim. So what we have are states, judicial bodies, UN organs uh, making claims about what has peremptory status. And it is in the reaction to those claims that we learn whether those uh, whether those norms actually have peremptory status. Um, and we'll never know uh, whether at the time the claim is made, the norm was already peremptory and the speaker was asserting something that was legally true at the time, or whether it wasn't peremptory yet, but it became peremptory through the response of the international community when they affirm what has been, what has been said. And I actually think that's a good thing. Uh, so the fact that at any given moment, we actually don't know where the, the, the community of states as a whole stands, I think is critical for the dynamism of international law. So imagine you knew at any given moment in time exactly what all the states in the world accept as law. Then there would be an answer. Either this norm is peremptory or it's not. If it's not peremptory, well, how can it become peremptory, right? because the whole norm is peremptory, if it is already accepted and recognized as peremptory. Well, if it's not accepted and recognized as peremptory, then you shouldn't do it now because it's not peremptory, right? So you'd be, you'd be frozen, right? The law would be frozen in, uh, in place. So it's precisely because we don't know where states stand at any given moment that states, international tribunals, scholars, the ILC can make claims, right? Based on legal reasoning about where the law stands, States in their response will tell us whether that's true or not. 
And we'll never know whether it was always true or if it became true only with the reaction of states. So that's sort of how I see the crystallization process uh, unfolding. In terms of exclusions, you know, several have been uh, mentioned. Um, one is gender discrimination. So racial discrimination, the apartheid made it onto the list, gender discrimination did not. Uh, that has been criticized, um, understandably so. Um, I think the human right to life is an odd uh, omission, uh, personally. Um, I, I, I was surprised by that. Um, some other interesting ones, um, uh, self-defense. It would be interesting to know whether the prohibition of aggression, since it is a peremptory norm, whether self-defense, which is a kind of exclusion or exemption from the prohibition of aggression or part of its definition, whether the right of self-defense is also a peremptory norm, that would be very interesting to, uh, uh, to, to think about and debate. Um, and I think the last one that I'll mention, and just the last one that, that, that comes to mind, um, is that there's some discussion uh, in, the, in the footnotes about whether norms regarding the protection of the environment um, are peremptory. Uh, so there's been just some discussion of that as well. And so I think it's important that the non-exhaustive list is non-exhaustive and it doesn't um, uh, freeze the, this debate in, uh, in place. So there are some notable and controversial uh, omissions. Thank you for that answer. I guess your answer would please many uh, scholars who are now advocating uh, on that ecocide issue. So maybe that they'll be pleased by your answer. Uh, the next question is from my uh, esteemed colleague, Nafiz Ahmed. He asked, can it be said that what ties all the use causes norms is that they all try to enforce the absolute minimum morality that one must expect from a state in order to consider the world as a principle. I, I think that's a you know very eloquent way of, of framing it. Um, that, right, that, that, that there's a, a minimum regard for human rights or for human beings that um, states have to show to kind of show that they are entitled to the power and responsibility and the legal status that they enjoy under international law. Um, and I guess the only other thing that I'd say, so I, I think that captures a lot of the peremptory norms. Um, it's interesting to think about the prohibition of aggression and whether it is fundamentally state-centric or human-centric. So there's been some discussion about this, that you know, there's a traditional view that the prohibition of aggression is state-centric, it's about protecting states. Um, there's a more modern view that because aggression is characterized by not just intervention or interference in the sovereignty of another state, but actually uh, the use of lethal violence, that we should understand aggression as a, a, a wrong against human beings, in which case you could fold even aggression into the conception that, that you laid out. So it would be interesting to pursue that. Um, then the right of self-determination is always an interesting one, uh, whether it's fundamentally about uh, individuals and their ability to participate in the collective life of their community, or whether it's the community as such that has an independent moral significance and therefore an independent uh, legal status. So it's interesting to think about those two norms, aggression and self-determination, and whether they're ultimately about individual human beings or whether they have a collective or even status dimension. So those are probably the ones that um, I would suggest, you know, thinking, thinking more about and maybe writing about. Thank you. The uh, next question, I'll actually, I have two questions that I think can be put together, so I'm going to do that. In a way, they are not directly uh, related to what you have covered this evening, but still, I think they have some resonance to your topic, so I'm putting them to you. Uh, these questions are from Naeem Ahmad and Saire Nazabi Sayan, two of our students here. Naim is asking that prohibition of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, crime of aggression are all norms of use causes that are uh, safeguarded by the Rome Statute and International Criminal Court, being one example of such an entity. Since these are imperative norms, should there not be liability or accountability to, to, for the non-state parties? Uh, mm. the, Question from Saira is also very close to this. She is saying prohibition of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, the crime of aggression are all norms of use causes. 
uh, by the Rome Statute and International Criminal Court. Now, what about the plight of the non-state parties? How do they get affected by these norms? Yeah, okay, so these are, are great questions. Um, so the first thing I wanna say is a, a, a bit of an aside, but I, I, I think it's worth saying. So one thing that I didn't um, mention as sort of a, a mark against the view that non-derogability is the core idea in peremptory norms is that only states can derogate from a norm through treaty or some other means. So if the essence of peremptory norms is their non-derogability, then they can't apply to individuals. And indeed, Roger O'Keefe, that's his view. So Roger O'Keefe takes the view that peremptory norms are not binding on individuals because they are defined by their non-derogability and only states can derogate. Therefore, peremptory norms are only binding on states, not on individuals. So they, peremptory norms can exist in parallel with international crimes, but they cannot be identified with international crimes because international crimes um, are committed by individuals. Only a state can breach a peremptory norm. Right? So I think that's a mark against the view that peremptory norms should be understood in terms of their non-derogability. It's just that when a peremptory norm is binding on a state, one consequence of that is that the state cannot derogate from it. But a peremptory norm can also be directly applicable to an individual, to a non-state group. You know, So take the basic rules of international humanitarian law, peremptory norm, no reason they can't bind a non-state armed group, even though a non-state armed group cannot derogate from uh, from a, a rule of international law. It's a bit of an aside, but I think it's close enough to my talk that I, I'll, I'll mention it there. Um, so in terms of the implications for non-states parties of the Rome Statute, so I think there are, are potentially several of them. So it, if, so if it would aid in the, in ending, um, uh, a breach of a peremptory norm to support accountability mechanisms for the perpetrators of international crimes, then I, I think non-state uh, parties to the Rome Statute are actually under an obligation to do so. Uh, so, so suppose you're a, a non-state party um, for whatever reason, but now there is a genocide ongoing. One way you could cooperate to help bring that genocide to an end is to create accountability or support accountability mechanisms for the perpetrators of that genocide. That might include arresting perpetrators who are present on your territory. It might include uh, supporting investigations, right, financially or otherwise. Um, so I think those are things that you, you have to do, right, just under the conclusions as they stand, cooperating through lawful means to end a serious breach. I think more interesting ones, and potentially this could affect the law of immunities as well, although that's very controversial. Um, the, uh, the next step, I think, would be thinking about not just ending a breach that is ongoing, but actually taking measures to prevent future breaches. So supporting uh, criminal accountability mechanisms might be a way not only to stop ongoing breaches and bring them to an end, but also prevent future breaches. Now that's not part of the conclusions as they stand, but it's a logical extension, right? Again, if you think that the rationale for the duty to cooperate to end ongoing breaches is to protect the values at stake, then a natural extension of that obligation would be an obligation to prevent future breaches by supporting accountability mechanisms. And that would be binding even on non-state parties. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is also from Naeem. Uh, he asks that states misuse their veto power to violate USCOM's norms, or maybe to tolerate the violation of USCOM's norms which we recently have noticed in the case of Russia. How can the international community limit the use of veto power in the face of use cousins violation? Yeah, so it's a great, uh, it's a great question. One notable and, and um, 
feature of the commentaries, uh, which was controversial with at least a few members of the commission, was that it explicitly uh, says that members of the Security Council and really any international organization with discretion uh, have an obligation to exercise that discretion uh, to help bring uh, peremptory norm violations to, to an end. Um, and so that means that members of the Security Council have an obligation not to exercise the veto and indeed to support resolutions that would uh, end ongoing violations. And so obviously Russia would be, uh, would be in breach of those collateral obligations. So that's a striking result uh, under, the, um, under the conclusions as they stand, or the commentaries as they stand. Um, it's an interesting question whether the whether that view has implications for the legal validity of the exercise of a veto. I think you can make that argument actually. So basically what you would have to show is that the exercise of the veto is impeding the, uh, well, sorry, the, the use of the veto is actually part of the violation. So it's contributing to the violation by impeding its prevention. So the, the exercise of the veto is itself part of or contributing to the violation. And then you would have to argue that the consequence of that is the invalidity of the exercise of the veto itself. And again, neither of these are settled law now, but the rationale is pretty clear, I think. Uh, it follows logically from the law as it stands. So I think that's an argument that, that could be made, that it's a logical extrapolation that the exercise of the veto to prevent an ongoing violation contributes to that violation and therefore the veto itself is legally invalid, both for internal purposes within the UN and for external purposes as well. So I think that argument can be made. The other thing to say is that I think one thing that we saw was the bypassing of the Security Council uh, and the use of the General Assembly, uh, where notably a few states actually expressly invoked um, the fact that Russia was violating a peremptory norm prohibiting aggression to justify their own vote in favor of the resolution. Um, so I think that that's another thing that we that we saw and that makes uh, that makes sense in that context where there's an ongoing violation where actually the Security Council as such wouldn't really be adding that much, but the General Assembly can uh, kind of rally states uh, together and create a common framework for uh, collective response. Thank you for that answer. We are almost out of time. So this would be our last question. If one lays the emphasis on the non-derogability of the use of rather than on the fundamental values, can then one argue that there can be some sort of regional use cousins as some scholars seem to suggest? What is your view on that? Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a very interesting connection. Um, so what the commentaries say is that regional use Kogans is uh, incompatible with the universal applicability of peremptory norms, and that the universal applicability of peremptory norms derives from their non-derogability. And so as I, as I mentioned in, in the talk or discussed in the talk, I don't think that argument works. I don't think you can get universal applicability from non-derogability. Uh, and, and similarly, I think non-derogability and regional use Kogans are completely compatible. There's no reason why a group of states in a region or united in some other way uh, can't agree among themselves that a given norm binding only among themselves is non-derogable, that none of them can set it aside by further agreement between you know, two members or something like that. So the idea of regional use Kogans, if all use Kogans mean is not a non-derogable norm, a regional non-derogable norm is perfectly um, uh, a, co a perfectly coherent notion, right? That could be established in law, but none of us would call that a peremptory norm because it lacks all these other features that we think peremptory norms have and lack the uh, same basis in the fundamental values of the international community as a whole. Uh, so again, I think that's a mark against the non-derogability centered view of peremptory norms. Thank you so much for the answer and for your excellent talk. Uh, have a good day. Thank you so much.